I'm joined this afternoon uh, by Captain Dan Henley of an organization called 911 uh, Pilot Whistleblowers. Uh, their website is 911pilots.org. Um, and uh, we're going to be discussing today all things to do with uh, the aeronautical piloting um, evidence surrounding the 9-11 uh, attack and the concerns over the official narrative and the, the search for truth. So, um, uh, Dan, if you could perhaps give us a, initially a brief introduction as to who you are and uh, how, you, uh, how you came to be questioning the official 9-11 narrative. Okay, uh, David. I currently serve as a director and international public spokesperson for this global grassroots effort called 9-11 Pilot Whistleblowers, whose purpose is to show that the uh, aircraft were electronically hijacked by a system called the Uninterruptible Autopilot that remotely takes control of the aircraft's autopilot and flight management computers and drives the aircraft to their target. And once this system is engaged, the uh, pilots can no longer uh, disconnect the uh, autopilot uh, and they've lost control of the airplane. Uh, and, and, and Dan, so what your personal uh, backstory and, and, and experience, uh, what is that? Okay, I commenced flying over 50 years ago in 1968. First as a civilian pilot going to a junior college where I achieved my private commercial instrument and multi-engine rating by 1970 before going on to Southern Illinois University to get a math degree. And I did fly during that time frame as well. And when I graduated in 1973, the Vietnam War was going on and I had to make service plans, so I chose naval aviation. And after flying three different training aircraft, I flew the uh, four engine P-3 Orion aircraft that was used to track Soviet submarines during the Cold War. And in 1978, uh, I was hired by United Airlines as a pilot, and over the course of the next 25 years, I flew uh, seven different aircraft, accruing over uh, 20,000 flight hours over a career span of 35 years. So that's my experience. Well, yeah, it, it, that, that's what you would call comprehensive in terms of pilot experience. <laughs> so yeah. for, from the point of view of someone who's who's got that degree of flight experience on... Uh, on large aircraft, four-engined aircraft, and um, uh, you 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 came to the the nine eleven story. Um, yeah. And how did you react to what you were being told in the in the official narrative? Well, I was a triple seven cap, Boeing seven 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 captain out of uh, New York on nine eleven, and I was at Newark that day and saw the building mo smoldering in the south end of Manhattan, like everyone else, I, my knee-jerk reaction was uh, that we were under attack. But over a period of time, I began to see holes in the uh, aviation safety and security system, which led me to believe it was a farce and that we really weren't secure on board aircraft. And I received receiving a lot of pressure from flight crew to say something about some of the promises they had made us but didn't keep as far as security, which I did. and. I could spend a whole program talking about this, but ultimately I was medically grounded illegally in 2003 for speaking out about these issues. And over the course of five years, I took it to the government, to the, uh, to the Transportation Department, the FAA, Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice, and they closed my case without interviewing a single witness or reviewing any evidence. But when the reports start coming out, about the inexperience of these uh, pilots, that's what did it for me. I could not believe having flown Cessna aircraft myself and then having flown the 757-767 and then finding out they never had any training on those aircraft, I couldn't believe the official story. So that, that's when the big question mark came in. And it wasn't until a pilot named Captain Phil McConnell, which we can talk about later, introduced me to the uninterruptible autopilot in 2006. That was my aha moment. That was, that's how they did it. So, in that essence. So, 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 yeah, so to look at the difference between, I, I've, I've never flown anything, right? But the nearest I've been okay. to, the nearest I've been to flying is, is in, a, in a small aircraft island hopping, so I'm next to the pilot, right? Okay. 
the 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 level of difference if if you had some ability to fly a Cessna right and and you were then presented with the cockpit of a of a of a commercial airliner just just give some give, give some indication of the the scale of problem that would be presented with anyone asked to do that i mean how how well, we, how is it um what would how would they react well uh, I'm glad you brought that up because on our uh, website, nine of them pilots.org, there's a menu and there's a drop down on it. And if you go to cockpits, what we did was a, a photographic comparison of a Cessna 172 cockpit to that of a 767. And if you look at the 172, and the 172 is their primary training aircraft, a single in, light single engine airplane. And if you look at the uh, uh, photograph, you'll see the old round dial instruments. You see a few knobs, a few radios, and a few light switches. And then if you scroll down and look at the 767 cockpit and how immense it is, and the fact that they have CRT displays for, for their instrument panel, and these flight management computers that are the primary navigation system for the airplane, that these guys wouldn't have an idea how to operate or how, and you have to ask yourself, okay, from the point of the airplane being hijacked to the point of impact of the airplane, if that happened, uh, how did they navigate? It surely wasn't with these flight management computers. So from a pilot's perspective, it's uh, absurd to think that they could have hopped in these airplanes sight unseen and have flown them. And I believe the reason that 99% of the global population fell for the story is there they're not pilots, and they cannot conceive of the absurdity of this ludicrous notion. Yeah, so we're talking about taking someone who might have trained on a typewriter and giving them a mainframe computer and say, well, it, it, just the same, get on with it. Is that, that is a complete technological leap. They, 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 wouldn't, they wouldn't even have the starting point to, to cope. No, no. As a matter of fact, uh, when, I'm when we profile the hijackers on the website, we use this analogy, which wasn't original. We heard it and thought it was appropriate. But the pinpoint accuracy for these pilots to have hit, hit those uh, targets on their first attempt uh, would be akin to climbing in a large semi-tractor trailer that you'd never driven before, get it up to 500 miles per hour and try to drive it through a jiffy lube or a garage without scraping the sides of the truck. That, that's how absurd the story is. And a lot of people say, <clears throat> well, all they have to do is eyeball it. All they have to do is look at a building point and go, well, it's not that simple. Those buildings may have looked large, but those pilots hit it with pinpoint accuracy. And most people aren't aware that the uh, navigation systems on the airplane are derived from cruise missile technology. They're extremely accurate. So when the auto uninterruptible autopilot kicks in, yeah, it would have been possible for it to have been done with that, but not with these guys flying. Now, um, you've obviously run into career difficulties because of speaking the truth, right. and and um, I'm I'm you know, I'm very sorry that that has happened. Um, the uh, you know the medical exam. I'm, I'm I'm assuming it was a psychological examination that we yes, used. Yes, it was. Um, and this is this is a, a long and tried and trusted technique of totalitarian regimes of silencing dissent because you simply define dissent as insanity, and then you can use all the draconian powers uh, that the psychiatric profession can bring to bear to make sure that the opposition is no longer around to uh, to, to speak its mind. Um, uh, this is uh, Joe Stalin's tactic. It was called psychological pathogen. Patholo psychopathological methods of dissent where he would take uh, dissenters and throw them into an insane asylum to discredit them. Uh, so that's how, uh, that's how far back this goes. And it's a common practice, not just within the airline industry, but within uh, other industries and agencies of government as well. Yes, I, I remember when I, discovering that the, the Soviet version of the uh, DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual used in, in the West for uh, psychiatric conditions actually had a recognized psych psychiatric condition uh, that was denying the obvious 
um, uh, achievements of the Soviet Union. So if, if, yeah. you, if, you, if you complained about there not being any toilet paper in the stores, you were defined, by definition, you, you were insane. And uh, this, was, this was how it was done. So yeah, this is a, this is a, a as you say, a, a tried, and, tried and trusted, long-standing means of, uh, of silencing opposition. Um, now, uh, my, my own background is I'm a structural engineer. I have um, uh, spoken out about 9-11 on, on several occasions. Haven't suffered what you've suffered, um, but I have, I have had a bit of, uh, shall we say, pushback from other people in the profession who, who have not liked this uh, approach yeah. um, and who are unsettled by it or who, who have a desire to support the official narrative. I think because the implications of the official narrative being, being a lie are very hard for people to face because it, it, it then removes a lot of things that are central uh, beliefs in their life. And, and this, is, this, is, this is difficult to do. Um, so as I was raising structural issues to do with the 9-11 collapse and trying to keep the discussion on technical structural grounds, what would happen uh, would be other other engineers would come and they would they would ask me about explosives or how how explosives would be smuggled in or they'd ask me about the planes. So the conversation was always getting pulled off of the area I was trying to discuss and put into other areas. But on the on the planes, one of the things that was that I I, I remember raising was the, the, the speed, not just the accuracy of the planes and not just right. the um, miraculous ability of the incompetent Cessna trained pilot, um, but the actual speed of the aircraft as they came in. Right. Uh, so perhaps you could ex explore that for us and, and, and talk about what, what the actual <clears throat> you know, speed and altitude uh, was and how this compares to what you would have experienced and what's normally feasible. Well, uh, according to radar data and other information obtained through the Freedom of Information Act from the NTSB and other agencies, the speed at which these aircraft were clocked exceeded the maximum operating speed of a Boeing 757 and 767 at sea level by about 120 to 140 knots. And according to most uh, aircraft structural engineers, the uh, aircraft should have come apart. So. That leads you to believe what was it that was flying that day, or according to Phil McConnell and an author named Rebecca Roth, there was an airborne swap of airplanes, and perhaps another aircraft or airborne vehicle was replaced with the uh, hijacked planes with passengers on them. So would you say that the speed at least brings into question whether it was actually the planes that were claimed, whether yes. they, they could have even done that? That's correct. Uh, if you if you look, there's a photograph out there of United 175 hitting the South Tower of the Pentagon, and there are four independent photos that were taken, uh, one by CNN and three by other uh, independent photographers, and all four of them show a pod on the bottom of the aircraft. Now, the bottom of a 767 is smooth, and that pod is present, and there have been people saying, well, it's a reflection of the sun on the aircraft, it was Photoshop, or it was a shadow from the engine. But according to what I read, a Spanish photo photography expert uh, analyzed these photos and said, no, the pod was there. So if you believe that those photos were of United 175, uh, it wasn't that airplane. It was not that, a 767 because it doesn't have that pod on the bottom. Um. In terms of of debris recovered, was there any clues from the various crash sites? No, you look at uh, nine of them pilots on org doesn't really get into this because their focus on is on attacking the hijackers and the official narrative in that regard. But if you look at Shanksville, minimal debris, none at the panic, none at uh, uh, the twin towers, and only a few airplane parts that were picked up. And some people say they were placed there at the Pentagon. So there's the absence of airplane parts as well. And, and just before we get back to kind of the core area that, that, that your organization covers, briefly say a few words about the Pentagon, if you would. 
the I, I mean, I was struck by on the subject of the of the ability of the hijackers to fly the plane. Uh, I was struck by the um, performance of whatever hit the Pentagon as it came down, because it came down in this this spiral to come in exactly parallel with the ground, which seems um, rem <clears throat> remarkable even for a, for an experienced pilot. Right. As a matter of fact, we cover that on our website. Uh, Hani Anju, or the alleged Muslim hijackers that supposedly piloted American 77, it came in from the west, and at 7,000 feet is when it commences descending, accelerating 330 degree corkscrew turn to arrive precisely at ground level without striking the surface at over 500 miles per hour. Now, we've got a five minute video on the website that was pr produced by uh, Jesse Ventura's uh, uh, company when they were doing uh, conspiracy theory. And it was inter an interview with Rob Belsamo the uh, co-founder of another grassroots group called Pilots for 9-11 Truth. And in that, uh, Rob talks about Hani Hanjo. That's what the whole, uh, whole five minute video is about. And he describes how just one month prior to 9-11, Hanjo tried to rent a Cessna 172 from an airport in Maryland and they refused to rent it to him because he couldn't handle it. He couldn't take off or land the airplane. And then the last half of the video, another friend of mine, Rusty Amer, who's a highly qualified pilot, was in a simulator with a, a young pilot who had comparable experience to Hani Hanjur. And he attempts this maneuver three separate times. And every time he tried it, he crashed. So uh, at the end of the video, Rusty says to him, you couldn't do it and I couldn't do it either. And what happened was a number of experienced pilots got in and attempted this maneuver. And every time they tried it, they crashed. With the exception of one, I heard a captain named Philip Marshall on his 20th try attempt was able to hit just the building, not down at the surface like he did. So we believe that the target, whatever it was, was the Naval Intelligence Center. And you can get into that later as to why that was, uh, that was important. But uh, uh, there's, I hear four different theories out there. One, American Airlines 77 hit the Pentagon. Two, there was no, no airplane there, it was a missile. Three, there was an airplane there with a missile, as Phil McConnell believes, that fired the missile, but it wasn't uh, a Boeing 757. And the fourth one was there was just explosives inside the building with no airborne vehicle at all. So we don't, we don't address that on our website. We're just attacking the... Uh, hijackers. So uh, to, to come back to the, the, the core area that you're covering then, um, I, I, I discovered about the uninterruptible autopilot from Field McConnell uh, initially. He, he spoke at one of the UK column events um, and uh, it, 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 was a, it was a very striking presentation about just how, how powerful this is and how little um, the pilots and, and the rest of the airline industry actually knew about the capabilities of what they were flying. Um, so perhaps you could expand on how you discovered um, uh, you know, about about this device, what it does, and uh, and and also um, what is generally known or was generally known um, at the time, you know, about the capability of uh, of the uninterruptible autopilot. Well, in the uh... After 9-11, I established an, a global grassroots effort called Whistleblowing Airline Employees Association. And it was before Facebook and social media took off. So it was really a big email network. And we asked people to uh, forward the email to other people. And uh, I had uh, uh, put out the word as to how I was terminated. I had an affidavit that I sent out to a lot of people. And in 2006, out of the clear blue, somehow Phil McConnell got my phone number and he called me, I was living in Atlanta at the time, and uh, introduced himself. And at that time he told me he was uh, reporting illegal modifications on Boeing aircraft. And that the Federal Aviation Administration, Northwest Airlines, where he was a DC-10 captain, and the Airline Pilots Association, his union, 
this will sound familiar, but they were attempting to get him to see a notorious quack shrink in LA named Dr. James Elliott because they were gonna do the same thing that they did to me on him, give him a bogus diagnosis, and I still don't go, it's a setup. So Field, the retired uh, a couple days later, so he could serve as an expert witness in future litigation, which he did file later on, and he's planning on doing it again. But anyhow, it wasn't until several months into it, I, I introduced, you know who David Hawkins is? No, I'm afraid. No, oh, okay, that, that's the sidekick of a, a field. Look, I introduced the two. David came to me first, and he was looking for a pilot, preferably a fighter pilot, and I was engaged in something else at the time, and I couldn't help him out. And a couple of days later, Phil contacted me and I married him by email and they worked for five years and I was on their email network. So I was, daily we were exchanging emails. And when it eventually uh, was exposed regarding this uninterruptible autopilot, really it was my aha moment because I knew these guys couldn't do it. And when he told me the capabilities of the system, I went, so that's how they did it. That's how they did it. So that, that's how I came to know about it. But I will tell you, and I, we really haven't gotten into what our organization is doing, but we're recruiting pilots from around the world to get recorded testimony from them that back my assertions that I made at the beginning of the program. And without exception, every pilot we've contacted are totally clueless regarding this uninterruptible autopilot. They didn't even know it existed. Still, it's still not known? No. Okay. So, so I, I, you, you described its capabilities. Could you outline those for us? Well, I can't go into detail. I feel could better address this than I could, but there's two flight management computers on the airplane that I pointed out before. And uh, what they are, they have all the navigation system and they receive inputs from inertial reference units, air data computers, and a number of uh, radios on the airplane. And that's how the cruise missile accuracy is derived. But information can be externally uplinked into those computers. And that's what occurred. The uh, autopilot is taken away from the pilots and uh, the navigation uh, information is uplinked into the uh, flight management computers and away it goes. Now, if you Google Boeing Honeywell uninterruptible autopilot, you'll get a Wikipedia article and it's labeled as such. And it's misleading because it says that Boeing patented this in 2006 after 9-11. And that is true, they did. But we have solid proof that the system was developed in uh, as late as 1997 prior to 9-11. And that evidence is given on our website by uh, an audio recording of Rob Belsamo interviewing an avionics technician who actually worked on this system prior to 97, uh, in 1996, 1997. So if, if you listen to that audio, you'd see that there's four ways, of, one way of engaging an autopilot, that's turning the switch off on, okay? There's four ways of disengaging it. Turning the switch off, there's a little red button on the yoke or the steering wheel of the airplane you can press. You can apply a 70 pound or greater force on the yoke, or you can pull the circuit breaker on the system. Well, once this system is engaged, none of that works. Even if you pull every circuit breaker in the airplane, you can't disengage this uh, uninterruptible autopilot system. And I can only imagine the horror uh, that these pilots experience when suddenly their airplane made a, uh, an erratic turn and starts heading towards uh, New York. And it also somehow shuts off the radios and the aircraft transponder, which air traffic control uses to identify aircraft. So this system uh, does exist. It existed prior to 9-11, and we assert that it was employed and that these hijackers couldn't have flown the airplane. Um, if, if we could move on to the, the, the sort of broader movement, um, I'm uh, obviously being a structural engineer, I'm aware of all the work that Richard Gage is doing in Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And um, the the uh, research and structural analysis work that's gone into uh, Building 7, for example. But I'm also less well aware uh, that there are legal moves afoot and uh, that, that uh, the, the 
the pilot uh, nine eleven truth uh, effort is 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 uh, factoring into that as well. So, if you could give me your overview of where you see the the, the nine eleven movement as a whole, and where the sort of ongoing legal challenges are, as as, as far as you know. Well, right now the only legal act on the uh, planet has, was initiated by a group called the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. And what happened was this group of lawyers in the United States got together with the biggest 9-11 whistleblowers in the world that consisted of Richard Gage and his architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, scientists, uh, police, firemen, uh, and other people that had information. And they compiled 57 evidence packages and they presented it to the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of uh, New York, uh, Jeffrey Berman, and based on the evidence they pre presented him, he had no choice but to convene a grand jury investigation into their allegations that World Trade Center buildings one, two, and seven were brought down by controlled demolition and not by jet aircraft impact damages or the jet fuel fires that ensued. So what's happening right now is the Justice Department's dragging their feet because it looks like there's no action that's been taken. So the Lawyers Committee is moving forward with uh, suits to try to move the thing forward. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, but they, uh, <laughs> you're smiling, they were contracted by the government to investigate uh, the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7, and they concluded that it was brought down by a few office fires. Well, uh, there, it's been proven, for those that aren't familiar with Building 7, it came down at 520 in the afternoon at nearly the free fall acceleration of gravity in less than seven seconds due to the office fires. So I, I'll point out that never in the 100 year history of steel reinforced high rise office building office fires has any ever collapsed due to fire and on 9-11, three did. So, uh, what the University of Alaska conducted a three or four year study and released a paper several months ago, and it conclusively proves that all, I think it's 44 structural beams collapsed simultaneously on Building 7 as it pancaked down to a pile of rubble one story tall in less yeah, than seven the, seconds. The, the analysis by the, the university uh, was very striking. Yeah, and it showed that the only way, because they modeled the building um, uh, with a, a very refined model, and then they ran various scenarios to see if they could, uh, if they could get the model to behave as the building had uh, on 9-11. Now, this was uh, a, a collapse, which you quite rightly say was a free fall acceleration. Uh, it started with the central portion of the building going first, and then, then the, the, the outer columns going a, a, immediately thereafter um, and the only way they could uh, get their model to, uh, to to behave in the same manner that the building had done was to was to sever all of the columns um, more or less simultaneously a slight delay with the central ones going first um, which is of course controlled demolition and no other scenario that they run any sort of fire the, the reason I was smiling when you said NIST is NIST after years of head scratching because FEMA did a report on, on Building 7 as well and they came up with another explanation um, to do with a diesel fuel uh, store uh, being on fire and, and um, a, a cut off having failed and, and, and fed fuel into this fire. Um, that one didn't have any uh, traction. So NIST after years of trying came up with their explanation which was based on thermal expansion and a very dubious set of modeling assumptions to try and show that you had a, a progressive collapse of this building due to one beam being pushed off, it, off of its bearing by the expansion of another beam. Um, so the, the, I would have to say that the modeling effort from Alaska was, was far superior to what we know about the NIST model because of course the NIST model is still classified. Um, and raised uh, enormous technical con technical uh, concerns over the official 9/11 story. 
um, technical concerns that have not been reported in the mainstream media, uh, let alone addressed by uh, the authorities. Yeah. So, yeah. so at the moment, there, there, there was a grand jury. A grand jury was actually... Well, it's, un it's supposedly underway, but none of the witnesses have been called in, and they see no movement whatsoever, and it's been several months. So the way, the way we dovetail in with the Lawyers Committee, I've talked several times with the board of directors of which Richard Gage is on, um, uh, Dave Meismichel is their chairman, and Mick Harrison, their uh, chief litigator, and I just talked to him uh, several weeks ago. Uh, they're not representing 9-11 pilot whistleblowers legally. They're not even endorsing yet what we're saying. They're remaining neutral, and they say they have to right now. So what we're doing is video recording these pilots' testimony and forwarding it to Mick Harrison for review and to vet these pilots. And if we can get a sufficient number of pilots, all of who qualify as expert witnesses, to step forward with their testimony that resembles mine, then they're going to present this evidence to a U.S. attorney in hopes that they'll convene a grand jury investigation into our allegations. So that's, that's where we stand with the uh, Lawyers Committee. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do, just to finish off, if we may, is, is to find out what you know about Field McConnell, because we, we, we know uh, that he's, he's been arrested um, and he's now been um, held for some considerable time. Um, we've been getting positive feedback about how he actually is, but perhaps you'll know more. You could, you could give us an update on how, he, how he's keeping and uh, the, the status of his legal fight. Okay. Uh, I don't know how much uh, listeners know about him or what happened to him, but uh, he, was, he kind of broke away from me in 9-11. We still kept in touch, of course, but uh, he got involved with uh, child trafficking and pedophilia that led him to Broward County, Florida, and a lawyer down there named Tim Picasso. And... Uh, he had his uh, TV program online and he was broadcasting this information about Kim Picasso and she went to the judge and got a restraining order imposed on him that uh, prevented him from doing that and somehow he violated it. And this judge ordered him to be extradited from his home in Plum City, Wisconsin to Broward County. Uh, he ordered him to be arrested and uh, he was. And he was in jail in Plum City fighting this and the uh, governor of Wisconsin finally said, that's it, you're going to be extradited. So they sent him down to Florida, I believe on a bus, and he wound up in jail there for a couple months while the lawyers were appealing his case. And ultimately, he, they had him on three felony accounts, and I heard that he stood to serve three to five years in prison for them. Uh, but this Ken Picasso supposedly has dropped two of them, so it's down to one charge. And... The lawyers were successful in uh, procuring his release, and he's now under house arrest wearing an ankle bracelet, living with his son in Briard County, and they've cut him off electronically. They've got a gag honor on him. He can't eat. When his wife calls him, which is the only person that can contact him, a lawyer has to be present for the phone call. But as far as uh, getting on a computer or using a cell phone, he can't do it. So I got... I call, I am in contact with a woman in London, as a matter of fact, and another gen in Sweden who have almost daily contact with Denise's wife. And I just called yesterday because I knew we were going to discuss it today to get an update on him. And I got photographs of him and he's got a Florida sunshine fan and uh, a big smile on his face. He looks real healthy uh, and he's doing well. And he's just awaiting... Uh, a hearing. They did have a hearing set up a couple months ago, and then the COVID scare hit, and they canceled the thing. So that's as, as much as I know that he's doing well health-wise and otherwise, and he looked happy. So in one picture, he had a hammer, so <laughs> walking towards the camera. So. <laughs> well, okay, well, I'm, I'm delighted to hear he's well, um, yeah. and, and, and bearing up under all, all of uh, the, the, the trouble that's, that he's going through. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to see him once again in the UK uh, before too long. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dan, thank you very much uh, for, for briefing us today on, on the work of your organisation 
and on the, the ongoing fight to discover exactly what happened in 9-11. Um, yeah. We're coming up to the anniversary once again. And uh, it's, it's uh, vital that we, we don't let this uh, be forgotten because it's one of the key, um, the key moves that's changed our society from the one that we thought we were in, the one that we grew up in, with all of its problems, to something much more sinister, something where um, truth is no longer um, uh, something that you aspire to. It becomes a, a revolutionary act, as Orwell put it. It becomes something that you pay for, as you have, and as Field has, and it becomes something that you have to fight for. So it's a different world, and 9-11 was one of the big, the big milestones along the way. So we, we, need, to, we need to keep uh, the, the, the voices being raised for, 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 for truth and honesty about what exactly happened, and support those like you who, who, who work towards that end. So thank you for your work, and thank you very much for your time today. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, you too get to uh, be reunited with Field very soon. Yes, I intend to interview him as soon as they release him. So he's one of our expert witnesses, especially with regard to the autopilot. And I want to thank you, uh, David, for having me on the program. And if I could just mention real quick, if you do go to our, our website, 911pilots.org, at the top of the page, there's a Join Us tab. And all we need is your name and email address, and we can put you on our emailing list to keep you updated on our progress as we move along. That's super. Dan, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Bye-bye.